السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Uh, coming back to you in my weekly lecture after a very long time. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, congratulate you with the new Islamic calendar year. And may Allah make it fruitful and make it uh, peaceful for Muslims and everybody on the globe, living on the globe. Today we're talking about negotiation or negation. Actually, and before we start, in my introduction, I will talk about, first of all, I need to thank quite a few people who have been helping me. On the research side is uh, Sahar, uh, Amir, and Ahmed Sheikh from Idlib. And on the media is Sahar again, and Abdurrahman Nahas. In the introduction, I will talk about uh, negotiation. When you go back and to look at uh, uh, if you're going to a negotiating table, uh, you have to look at the map surrounding the areas where the conflict is. Don't go there without having a map with you. This is number one. Number two, you have to understand or we have to understand that in the other team, there's somebody who will be a troublemaker or a devil character, which is trying to spoil you, to get on your nerves, to try to get you off uh, during the, the negotiating process. Number three, you have to understand that some of the reasons of the negotiation is to, during the war or during uh, the revolution, is to give the other team the space and the time to lengthen the process to understand who is behind the revolution and who is behind those people who are actually standing to uh, 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 liberate their country from the colonial powers. The time, buying the time. Okay? So, map, people, and even if you look, I was watching uh, uh, Omar Mukhtar uh, movie, which is the line of the desert, and the negotiation, the, on the negotiation table between him and the uh, Italian leader at the time, uh, on the first time, they did not agree on anything, and that for a few months, he realized that actually they were buying the time to send more uh, forceful uh, army to the south of Libya at that time, to buying the time. So what is the definition of negotiation? Negotiation like a dialogue between two parties or maybe a trilogue, or more, two parties, or three parties, or four parties, or five parties. We are doing this dialogue every day between me and my wife, between me and my children, between me as a woman and my husband, between me and my employees, or between me and my superior, and so on, so on, so on, so on. So negotiation is nothing more, is, is not different to the daily process of making dialogue to agree on something, whether during in, in, the, in the family or outside the family in the community. So I'm just I'm going to mention twelve points. This is the first one or second one of them. Those twelve points will be for us, like a parameters or terms of reference for us when we go to the negotiating table. We have to take the boxes, and for each and every one of you on the negotiating table, to accommodate it the way you like according to the needs of your local community, or your people, and your ability, and your understanding of the negotiation. Not only that, you can make them 10, 5, 4, or 20, 30, 40. It's entirely up to you. This is not a Quran that actually you follow. It is just suggestion to you. Don't go to this table without preparing yourself from the very beginning. Next point, what are the limitations of our negotiation? Whenever you go to any negotiating table, whether it's inside the village or in the township or in the district, on the district level or on the, on the national level or international level between you and the other power during conflict, you have to know that you have a ceiling or limitation of your negotiation that you cannot actually cross it. Because you have been appointed by your community 
or by your own people to negotiate and this is the maximum limitation that actually you can give of concession to the other party. Before going there, you have to know your limits of negotiation. You are not negotiation, negotiating on a personal level or in behalf of your political party or in behalf of your jama'ah or in behalf of your uh, 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 group, tribe, you are negotiating on behalf of the community or on behalf of the country. So you have to be empowered to know what's your limitation and what's your ceiling. What are the characteristics, structure and composition of our negotiating team? Our negotiating team has to be inclusive should not represent only one political party, not only one theological background, not only one cultural background, not only one uh, uh, area, geographical area. It should be representing all of this. Plus, should include men, women, and young people, because each one of them have got different criteria and also different needs. This is number one. Number two, we should have a structure for our negotiating team. You have a leader, you have a vice, you have assistant, you have, you have, you have, you have, you have. Then in your negotiating table, in your negotiating team, you have to have this kind of troubleshooting individual who keep creating problems for the other team. Huh? To try to let them off the hook and lose the focus on concentration. This is how we structure the team of negotiation. Not only that, we have to have the expertise inside our team in political background, in historical background, in economical background, huh? in different speciality during the negotiating uh, process. Because negotiation is an art. It's not just a meeting. It's an art. It's a profession which made out of people who have the art and the skills of negotiating to be able to take the ship from right to left and to navigate through different uh, rocky uh, uh, sea to take the ship out to the safe side of the uh, shore, of, 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 of the uh, peaceful side of it. So it's an art, it's a profession, it is a knowledge, it's actually a teamwork. This is for our own team we're going to the negotiation. Also, we need to study the other team, the structure of the other team, the composition of the other team, the background of each one, of each one, each one member of the other team, whether it's theological or historical or tribal or social, whatever you call it. You don't go there blindly without knowing who is there. You know that the key for the character of the leader of the other team is A, B, C, D. You know, the weakness in the other team is A, B, C, D. You know, the strength of the other team is A, B, C, D, and so on. So you don't go to sit down with the people without understanding the quality, without understanding the knowledge, without understanding the specification and the specificity of each individual of the other people of, of the team, of the, of the other negotiating team. You have to study thoroughly who is there to sit down in front of you and how can you navigate through them to get the maximum from them or the maximum out of them. Next point, what is the mandate? Is it our own mandate? That means that you have to have a process of consultation with your own constituencies, not only one constituency, not only your political party, not only your political jama'ah, not only your clan, not only your tribe, not only your, uh, what do you call it, theological background with the community, with all the composition of each community. Because you are going to have your mandate will represent the needs of the community, whether they are from your tribe or from your background or the ethnic background, theological background, historical background, religious background, political background doesn't make any difference. You are representing the mass. 
the mass of the masses of the community and the mass of the masses of the country. You are not representing yourself. It's not a personal. Because you are a charismatic leadership, you don't take the lead huh, by yourself and ignore the needs of the people. So public. Who are our community partners and sympathizers? Before going to the negotiating table, we have to build partnership inside our community and in the regional, in the region as well. On the, on, on the village level, on the district level, on the town level, on the city level, on the national level, on the regional level. We have to build partners huh? and sympathizers who can actually stand up to support you during the process of negotiation. You don't go there without actually doing all this uh, uh, homework. Who are the partners and sympathizers, partners of the other? But of course, you are going with group X and they are coming with a package. We know the structure of their group. We know the composition, we know the background, but who is their partners? Who is their sympathizers? Who are their allies and supporters? Can we convince some of their allies and sympathizers and person to, to become with us? Or to have a neutral stand instead of being against us? This is another homework you need to do. You don't go there blindly because you can speak very well without knowing who is behind the other group of sympathizers, supporters, and allies, and partners. Who are the regional and the global players affecting the negotiation process? That's why I come back to the uh, 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 map. I remember one of the top uh, chief editors uh, from Egypt in the 50s after the Second World War, he wanted to sit down with uh, the late president of France, uh, Charles de Gaulle, and uh, he wanted to, make, to, to interview him. This man learned from him, from, uh, from the, uh, the late President de Gaulle, something. Whenever you sit down with somebody discussing an issue of a certain country, look at the, the geography of the area to understand who are the main players affecting your process of negotiation. And here, in areas... Like in the Middle East, the superpower in the area could be, I mean, regional, could be Turkey, could be, uh, what do you call it, Iran, could be Saudi Arabia, could be Egypt, could be Emirates. These are the regional powers in this area. In different area could be different players. Who are the global powers? Of course, you find that European countries, you find American countries, you find Russia, you find China, you find Japan. Those are global. So we don't go there empty-handed without understanding who are the people. Now, when I was in Africa a few weeks ago, you see, you find actually in, in a place like uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, many European and American companies there are playing uh, uh, the, the game in this and affecting the economy there. In a country like uh, uh, Chad and others, maybe France is the main player, followed by China and others. Those either regional or international global players, you have to know uh, uh, their impact on the process of negotiation. What are the depth and dimensions, the missing S, of the uh, uh, deep states in our country? Any country on earth has deep states, deep states with S. Some of them are good ones, like the establishment, where this institution, the institution of the establishment are serving the state itself. But because they are not apparent or, or, or obvious to the public, they are not actually seen. The public only realize the government institution, not the institution which belongs to the establishment. So this is a good deep state. The second best good state is if you are in a, a, a status of occupation and you have, a, a, you have groups who are trying to liberate their own countries. Actually, those groups definitely 
will not be apparent. They will be hiding because they want to remove colonization from their own country. Okay, this is another good example of the deep states. The third good example is in the history of humanity when the followers of the Prophet ﷺ were hiding uh, from the, ty the tyranny of the rulers of that area. This at the time of Jesus, peace be upon him, against the Roman, and this time of Muhammad ﷺ, peace be upon him, against the uh, Qurayshite. Because they want to save their followers from the atrocity and punishment and torture of the Roman and the non-Muslim Qurayshite at that time. These are the good deep states. The bad ones is the one who is criminal, which is the deep state within there, the thieves, uh, the pimps, the prostitution, uh, the drug dealers, the terrorist groups, radical group, extremist groups, all these are not doing any good for the countries. So they are deep state. You have to know that because those people are impacting and affecting the process of negotiation in certain area of the country. And the, the proverb say, or the, or the situation is, the more democracy you have, the more freedom and liberty of civil society, space, and the less evil deep states we have. The more repression, the more evil deep states we have. This is something which you have to understand. The more you bring autocratic dictatorship regime, the more you have a bad deep states nobody knows and corrupting the whole country as a whole. Do we have alternative or contingency plan in case of negotiation fails or in a blockade? Yes. When you go there onto the negotiating table, you should prepare a package or alternative plans. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. You'll be like this man of the playing cards. If plan number one fails, you have got plan number two, you have got plan number three, you have got plan number four, five, and so on. So don't go only with one way or my highway. There's nothing in negotiation called one way or my highway. If I do this with my wife, will end with divorce within 24 hours of marriage. What's to follow negotiation? Okay, now, or today is 18th of uh, September, or 19th, 19th of September, we signed up the peace treaty. How are we going to build peace? We know in the, from the history that the, the, the leaders of war, during the war, time cannot lead the process of peace. Because the mechanics and the philosophy of thinking and the culture of war is quite different to the mechanics and the philosophy of thinking and the culture of peace. So do we have, after, after the peace negotiation is being signed, okay, do we have plans for building social security and peace and others? Do we have it? Or we start thinking about it after the peace agreement signed. This is wrong. We have to be prepared. While we are doing the negotiating process, somebody actually is planning for the plans after signing the peace. How can we build peace practically in our community? This is number one. Number two, do we have sufficient human financial resources, qualified community leaders that can build social cohesion, stability, security, and peace? Who is going to lead the peace process after, after negotiation, after signing the peace agreement? Do we have those human resources or not? Do, if we don't have them from our own political party, we have to bring them from the whole community. It's not one color. It's not one culture. It's not one religious background. It is the best in the community for the best of the people in the community whether from my cultural background, from my value-based background, from my religious background, from my political background, because they are going to be civil servants. And you should pick and choose the best from among us, the best inside the community to build peace. Because the peace builders after peace negotiation are quite different to the people who are actually involved in the conflict.
Who are our peace building partners? Of course, once, not once, before we sign up the peace treaty, we should know who are our partners who can help us in building the peace process in our own country. On the regional level, on the local level, and on the global level. We have to identify them while we are doing the negotiation, as I mentioned before. Do we have more than one alternative peace building process and path? Suppose that we have one plan A for peace building after, the, uh, after signing up the treaty. It failed or it's failing partially. Do we have another alternative, third alternative, fourth alternative, one roadmap, second roadmap, third roadmap, fourth roadmap, and so on and so on. Don't go there with one, with one roadmap only. With more than one road maps, which can let you to stabilize and establish peace for the country. What are the scopes and limits of our concession to establish social justice, peace, and security? And this issue, we have a ceiling that we do not exceed. I'm not going to give more concession than that. That's why in your post-negotiation and you have in this concession, you have to involve most of the main players in the country. Because the country does not belong to you only as a political leader or as a political party or as jama'a, يعني, religious jama'a, religious group or culture or whatever it is. The country is made out of all of this. So I have to include every and each one of those leaders who are affecting the process of peace building after negotiating, uh, peace negotiation is signed up. So what I mentioned of these 12 points is not a Quran. It's something for us to become like a parameter or to become like t terms of reference. You can add onto them some uh, some more point, or you can remove some of them. You can make them instead of 12, make them 15, make them 20, make them 5, make them 7. It depends on what's your need in your locality. Nothing is Quran, nothing is Bible. It's all uh, initiatives created by people from their, own, from their own experience. They would like, actually, you, whenever you go to a negotiating table, you should be prepared. You should be prepared. You should be prepared. And we should learn from the history of how other people managed to succeed to gain what they want from the negotiating process. Negotiation is like a dialogue. If our dialogue with our children and our family is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, in a deadlock, We'll lose our children and we'll lose our family. Jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.